everyone. Welcome to our MASK ultrasound Zoom meeting today. And we are so privileged to have a very distinguished speaker from the United States. And uh, I met him maybe two, three years ago in Hong Kong for the first time. He was uh, the former president of the American Academy of Orthopedic Medicine. And I'm so proud to invite him here in our meeting today. And he's no other than Dr. Thomas Band. And uh, he will talk about the placental allografts in interventional regenerative medicine. But before we begin, let's just pause for a moment for a short prayer. Let us pray. Loving Father in heaven, we thank you for this beautiful day. We thank you, Lord, for saving our lives in spite of these challenging times that we are in. You are always there for us to keep us safe and to, in preserving our lives. Can you bless Dr. Thomas the uh, shared his expertise on this topic. May he continue, Lord, to use him wherever he is to treat patients and to make them well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you Dr. for that. that Band, it's all yours now. Okay, well, thank you for the introduction. I just looked at the, the day we met in Hong Kong was, was July uh, 8th, 2016. So right. five years ago, uh, we were together presenting on stem cells in, in Hong Kong, right. uh, which, was, which was a great time. And it was great to, to, to meet you and stay connected with you. And I'm, I am privilege to be here and honored to be here with you guys i just wish i was there because i because i just saw a beach in the background and uh i think i'd rather be at the beach than here where it's raining outside so anyway i i, I know i'm we're kind of way behind as far as the timing goes so we're going to run through these slides if you guys can't see my slides or if you uh i, I i'm happy to share everything here so please uh, don't feel the need to take a bunch of notes or, or feel like you have to record it in some way. I'm going to, I will be happy to email each and every one of you guys uh, all the slides. So, okay. So the title of my talk this evening or this morning for you guys is, is Placental Allographs in, in IROM. And so what, what I'd like to do is just run through what the placental tissues are, how they're characterized, how they're actually uh, made, and then what are some of the clinical applications being used in the United States and some other countries uh, in terms of these biologic products. Oh, shucks. Here we go. So I always like to, when I'm doing a, a presentation, I always like to talk about goals and objectives. You know, what exactly are we trying to do here besides me bore you guys to death? I mean, I would, I'd like to introduce some concepts, discuss some, some clinical characterizations, characterizations of these tissues that people are using, and then look at some of the, the relevant uh, clinical research that we have right now in, in interventional orthopedics. And then, so, you know, so by the end of this, if you're listening, you ought to be able to do some of these other things here I've listed here. From an objective perspective. Uh, disclosures, um, I am, I am in full, I run a full practice. I'm, uh, you know, I'm not just a research guy. I do, I do full uh, five days a week clinical medicine. I do some research as well. Um, I do consult for in the past and currently uh, for regenerative medicine companies. I have stock in, in certain companies. Um, and I'm, I'm a Regenix affiliate, and I'm also involved in the corporate program where we try to save companies money uh, instead of doing orthopedic surgeries. Okay, so let's talk about placental-derived tissues. So if we remember from our medical school training, we, when we think about the placenta, it's really two major parts, right? The, the placenta itself, right? And then you have the, the umbilical cord that comes to it. And so we're going to talk about the 
the amniotic tissues here. And then we'll talk about the umbilical cord and its products. And I can talk about each one of those about how they're how they're being currently used and what are some of the pitfalls as well as some of the potential uh, potential big benefits in the future of, of these of these types of tissues. So just to review a little bit um, here on the, I guess it would be the right, I hope you guys can see this, uh, hope you can see it, but the, the amnion, the amniotic, um, or here in the womb, you have the placenta and then the, the entire amniotic sac, and it is a, a tri-layer, tri-laminar sac with the amnion, the cor chorion, and then a reflective amnion, and all of this is overlying the placenta, right? And then the umbilical cord that comes and attaches to the baby. So when we talk about products coming from uh, these tissues, I wanna be super clear um, that, you know, I'm a Catholic, I'm a Christian. This is in no way embryonic in any fashion, okay? So this is umbilical cord or placental derived tissues. Has nothing to do with babies um, at all. Okay. So when you're talking about the amnion, you're, you're really talking about the actual layers of the tissue of the amnion, chorion, membrane, or the fluid that the baby swims in, right? So those are two, the two things we'll talk about here in a minute. And so just again, going back to the ethics of this, how is it that these, that, you know, is, it, is the baby in any way involved? The answer, no. The membrane is taken uh, from placentas after birth, after babies to mom, everything's cool, placenta's examined, and everything is good. So it typically just goes right in the trash. Well, what... What has been known actually since the 1930s is that that membrane is full of stem cells. And if you were able to take that membrane right then and there and cut a square out and then walk down the hall and stick it on, on a, say, a burn victim, right? As they actually did in the 30s before we had uh, knowledge of all these sexually transmitted diseases and transmittable uh, diseases, they did that in, in, uh, and after World War I uh, and people in the, in the U.S. military, and these, th these wounds were healed fantastically. And it just kind of disappeared for a while, um, decades really. So fluid actually is, is, and it's important to know this, is the fluids collected upon only breach, not you know, only uh, healthy, C-sectioned, scheduled, c-section babies so we have much better control of the fluid and of the sterility of it and you know if in other words if you tried to do this uh during a normal spontaneous vaginal delivery you, you know you could imagine it would you would have a lot of contamination okay so again let's go back to the histology of them just the mem on the membrane side three separate layers amnion chorion intermediate layer layer and then really this kind of reflected layer as it wraps back around um so when we talk about dehydrated amnion chorion membrane this is basically a a freeze-dried um and we say d dhacm this is dehydrated human okay um the way this is done is it's it's freeze-dried it's dehydrated immediately and then it's reconstituted once it's proven to be safe there's over 225 plus known growth factors cytokines chemokines regulatory proteins i mean this thing is just you, you keep counting and it keeps coming more and more and more so it's going to be interesting the more we study this one of the key things i'll talk about here is hy hyaluronic acid in the in these areas can be can be pretty interesting pretty um highly concentrated so here's just a side-by-side -side comparison um 
of PRP and, and HCAM. Now, it's, it's kind of hard to see. I hope you guys can see this. But long story short, you can tell that PRP has this list and <laughs> dehydrated membrane has this big list. So it's, it's, it's got some good stuff in it, okay? What it doesn't have is stem cells, and we'll, we'll get into that later. Okay. Um, so when we look at the histology of the fluid itself, we talked about the membranes here. So this is membranes, and now we're talking about the fluid. Well, what about the fluid? The fluid is going to have same, bunch of growth factors. It also has these secretomes. Now, secretomes are something that's kind of, kind of uh, the latest and greatest thing that's coming because we've all heard of exosomes. We've heard of stem cells. We've heard of mesenchymal stem cells. And now there are some who believe that, well, the stem cells are really these mesenchymal signaling cells instead of stem cells. Um, and so, you know, Maybe it's it's these it's this this excretory stuff that the cells are putting out, and they're signaling through these exosomes. So what we what we know is that exosomes are being used in all kinds of different ways, and it's got some real positive positive results in in some ways. But you know, some folks will believe that that's more of just the trash. It's more of the waste of the of the stem cell. So. At this point, we really don't know. We just know what's happening clinically, and there's a lot of, a lot of questionable things going on as far as, you know, how many, how many patients are being treated with these things without doing good studies. But this, this new thing is what we're finding is something called secretomes, where the, the cell actually purposely secretes this. Um, now, what's in it, we don't know yet, but it'll be interesting to see. Okay, when you, when you look at the fluid, it is, again, packed with growth factors. It does have an extracellular matrix, um, but it's prime, when you see the cellular pieces, it's primarily epithelial cells, i.e. the layers, right? So, <clears throat> and those are, the, the way those are characterized is by the, the cluster of differentiation uh, that you see here. But you also do see some 73 and 90 and 105. And, and what those are, the, when you look at CD73 and 90 and 105, those are not pathognomonic for mesenchymal stem cells, but all mesenchymal stem cells do have those. And so we think, yeah, there's probably some MSCs floating around. It makes sense, right? I mean, it's a fluid matrix and, and you, you know, you, you've got to have the baby surrounded by the best you got. So... It makes sense to me that that would be there. Um, the issue is, can you, you know, are they viable? Are these cells viable after processing for sterility? And that's the big argument now in the United States. And this lawsuit after lawsuit coming out, and the FDA is going ballistic with with this stuff because you have chiropractors who are who are. Uh, you know, they're, they're claiming, hey, I'll, I'll inject your knee with stem cells, but it's really just a little reconstituted growth factor amniotic fluid matrix that's been, you know, cooked in the oven to a powder and then re reconstituted with sterile water. And then they say, oh, look, this is stem cells. To this date, uh, I know that Chris Centeno, some of you may or may not know, but he's up in Denver. And he has a real, really uh, high-tech research laboratory. And every single um, amniotic, um, amniotic fluid matrix and, and um, well, just the fluid matrix. He hasn't done membranes. I don't think he should. Actually, I think he does. The amniotics have, have not been shown post-processing to grow stem cells and form colony forming units in vitro um, in the lab. And so that's a problem because by the, the standard, the laboratory standard of what is called a stem cell, 
is that it must be plated and it must grow CFUs and form CFUs. So there, that, that becomes basically a legal issue when, you, when you're trying to say, hey, um, you know, hey, Dr. Castro, you, you told me you gave me stem cells, but there's no stem cells in this. And so, uh oh, now we have a problem. So that is something that you'll you'll probably hear more about, for, at least on the American side. It's it's been uh, it's been interesting to say the least. Okay, so when we talk about allografts, there 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 must be a hundred companies out there. There, I think we probably started at two hundred, and we're we're probably actually down to about fifty because the FDA is cracking down on these companies, and they're. It's a it's a federal fine to be, you know, to be making stem cells without without the proper uh, pharmaceutical license and this kind of thing. So the 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 companies are definitely narrowing down, and your and your choices of a quality product are narrowing down, um, which is good. We we need quality. We don't need patients being injected with anything that's not not quality, right? So. <clears throat> when I say on this slide, you know, the allograft type and form matters because not all products are made the same. Some companies, unfortunately, are just, just doing things very quickly to sell as much as they can and make a bunch of money and then leave the, leave the country. I mean, um, these... The products are, are, are quite, quite empty. Can you guys meet so my internet is stable? Can you guys hear me? Yes? Don't know. I uh, hope you, hope you, uh, Jimmy, if you, if you're, um, there, come back, show me or talk to me or something. Hey. Um, but so these products, again, um, it's like PRP or bone, bone, BMAC would be different by the, by the way you spend. You hear? Okay. Um, you know, your, your, um, your, your cellular prep is going to be different by the technique that you use to prepare it, right? What's the same thing with these products? These graphs depend on how the company processes very significantly. So, you know, just just remember that, and make sure you if you're going to purchase one, you either call me or, or look do your research on these companies because uh, you know you, I wouldn't want you to get some junky stuff and put that in a patient. But on the on the amniotic fluid again taken from a scheduled C-section of a healthy baby, it's either going to be cryo preserved or ambient in in some type of injectable matrix like a like um, sterile water or uh, sterile D5 or something. Then you have what's called lipolyze, which is, which is again, all injectables, and it's freeze-dried, so it goes the other way. So you either, you either, you either cook it or you freeze it, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, the third type is, is actually using the membrane itself. Now, these these are super interesting because um, they have, and they've gotten, they've gotten a lot of traction uh, in surgery because they really work well for especially laminotomy and laminectomy defects, as well as wrapping nerves in neurosurgery and wrapping uh, tendons. Um, it, it's, it's, I believe though that form is here to stay. Okay, so now moving on to umbilical. Remember your anatomy uh, from embryology and pediatrics, right? Your umbilical cord has, if it's normal, right? It's got three vessels in it, the umbilical vein and two arteries, which are surrounded by Wharton's jelly. You have a perivascular Wharton's jelly and you have just the, the rest of it's all Wharton, the intravascular, uh, intervascular rather, Wharton's jelly. Um, then also in the umbilical cord, you actually have the tissue, you have the, the lining, which we are finding out now is, is really has a lot of cells. So the core tissue, core tissue is compromised of, of many different sources, you know, Wharton's jelly, lining, and membrane. The cord blood 
is really you're pulling straight out of the out of the vessels. Okay, so it's not like you're taking you know, when you when you have an umbilical cord product, it is that which is within the cord within the uh, vessels, not any of the Wharton's jelly or any of the other tissue, and that becomes a little bit important uh, later. So when we when we talk about okay, in fact, comes it becomes important right now. So within the within the cord itself, you've got tons of growth factors, and then look at this, this is where it gets interesting. You actually have cellular components within the Wharton's jelly that are MSCs, at least by the CD differentiation. Now, do they grow, right? Because that you have they have to grow in culture to be able to call them MSCs. But man, if you know, if a if a guy is wearing a tuxedo and he's holding the ring and he's got his flowers, you'd say, well, that looks like the groom. Uh, you know, or, or or even better, if you know. If the if the if a woman's wearing the wedding dress, man, that looks like that might be the bride. If she doesn't enter the church, maybe she's not, right? So, but in other words, it really looks these really look like MSCs. It's just will they grow? Um, again, we see this in cryopreserved Wharton's jelly. So we know in cryo pro properly cryopreserved um, Wharton's jelly will have MSCs in it. Okay. Now, umbilical cord, this is kind of interesting, is that you, you, you primarily see, again, tons of growth factors. So if you want to use something for a growth, a growth factor prep like you would an autologous uh, blood growth factor prep from one of your, you know, PR, that's what PRP is, right? In fact, I, I just want to let you know, I, I'm not a fan of PRP. I think it's a terrible acronym. Uh, even... Even as physicians, platelet-rich plasma doesn't really tell us exactly what it is. I mean, what it really is is a an autologous blood-derived growth factor concentrate. So I call it a GFC, a GFC prep. That's that's what I, I think is a, a better way to say it. You know, um, because that's really what it is. It's a growth factor prep. So. If you if you say you know uh, this patient doesn't want me to use her blood or she's you know anemic or something that we I don't you know she doesn't uh, she really I can't pull a bunch of blood on her so but I want to get a nice concentration for this I want to get something for this shoulder this rotator cuff tear um, that can help her well this might be a, an option because you're, you're going to have great growth factor concentration, as you saw on the slide, more than PRP. And then here, you're going to have these cellular components, so, some, I mean, mainly, mainly what's called HSC or hematologic stem cells and endothelial cells. Um, but you also have some 45 and 90. Now, the interesting thing is here is you, is you have these what we call nanoparticles are exosomes and secretomes and that's what we had talked about earlier these things are you know exo is when is what some some of the physicians here will call it you know it's like the poop of the of the stem cell but the secretome is actually like hey i'm, I'm handing you a, a bounty i'm handing you some bread um i don't know which if those folks are right because i i see clinically i see that the exosomes can work in some things so i don't think that's just poop um, these are often marketed as non-immunogenic, which means, you know, like, oh, yeah, it's, it's it, it, you won't have any kind of rejection at all. That's not true. They're less immunogenic, um, but you will, you, it is possible to have some, some host um, graph response, you know, and people can have big painful flares and, you know, um, so I, I think that's just, a misnomer to say it's it's not it's not truly ingenuous to say it's non-immunogenic. I think that there are some cases of some pretty bad flares. Same thing as above, right? Um, you know, not on not all umbilical cord companies are the same. They don't do things the same. They don't they don't uh, have the right morals and ethics involved. So you just have to be careful and make sure you you vet that company well. If you ever have a, a question, just email me. Um, I've, I've really looked at this whole 
game for just this. I mean, I've been doing, you know, regenerative medicine for 20 years, but this is, this part of the game is really kind of exploded in the last five. Been looking at it for about eight. Um, so I, I, I can tell you that, give you a good handle on, on which companies uh, are, are, are pretty, you know, are ethical and doing things correctly. Again, the membranes, the UC membranes are, are becoming more and more interesting because it's a trilameter membrane. It's full of cells and it seems to be working really well to patch holes and wrap nerves uh, for the neurosurgeons. Okay, well, let's get to the good stuff. So let's talk about um, knee arthritis. We all treat knee arthritis. We all want something that can work for our patients with knee, ar knee arthritis. Um, so there was a study in 19, and I kind of like this study, you know, the, the way they separated the, group, the groups. And you can see here in the study that it was, it was a very low powered study. We certainly need to have much more for like, like this. The other thing to know about this study is that it was cultured cells. It was cultured, true MSC stem cells that were derived from the umbilical cord. So what they did is take, you know, took the umbilical cord, cultured, culture expanded, and then that's how they were able to get a 20 million uh, count dose um, for for these different groups. Long story short is that the the when they did two treatments, it really helped these patients, and so that's certainly interesting, right? I mean, two treatments, one injection, that's pretty interesting. So um, again, it's underpowered. It needs to it needs a lot more study on that, but interesting study. Um, here's another one by Wang. This goes back all the way to 2016. What was interesting here is it was Wharton's jelly. And this is, this one really inter is interesting to me because Wharton's jelly has the highest um, hyaluronic acid count of anything. It's got higher, higher HA counts that, and it's a high density HA. So, you know, we have these drugs that we get, we have to buy from drug companies that are thousands of dollars, you know, that, that are um, like Synbisc and Gel One and all these, I don't know if they're different names around the world, but, you know, these are, these are, are drugs and, and tools in our toolbox that to me work at best, at best, uh, you know, not even half the time, third of the time, and they were, it's very limited. So, you know, I'm, I'm interested in these, this, this piece, because, you know, you're, you're dealing with a, with a, a product that can be made much more cheaply than these, these uh, patented pharmaceutical products. Um, again, another cultured umbilical cord study, but they just added uh, collagen to it. Um, and th again, this is a, another good one, where, which I like that they showed, they actually look at MRI images all the way through, and they, sh they actually proved that you had regenerative, regenerated tissue was observed. And so, we, again, culture expanded, so it's not like it just shows up in a thing and you just poop. No, it, it, these are culture expanded techniques. Um, and then the, the cells were, were shown to stimulate cartilage regeneration. So this is interesting, exciting stuff. So here's that, here's that uh, study by, by Sadlik and his crew up in Poland. And you can see, you know, this is arthroscopy. And then we look at A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. And you, you can see that there's no doubt that you barely have anything here on the, in the troclea. And then come back and look here and then you can see this thing is 
is absolutely getting better. And that's just a six weeks follow up. So super interesting stuff. Trigger finger, God Lord, I'm not talking about that. It's this is this is a much this is a much better slide here because this is um, various studies. I'll let you look at this, you know, as, as deeply as you want. But the next slide is going to be the, the the money shot. Let's see if I can get it to go. Don't know why not wanting to go. So I guess I gotta. Here we go. All right. So this is the this is the slide you want to spend some time on, okay? Because you can see in the shoulder. Look at this response rate in shoulder. And this was done by our, our, our friend and, and colleague, Rahul Desai, out in Portland. And thank you, Rahul, if you're on the call for lending me this slide. Um, and thanks for doing this work. This is great. But what he did is he, he ended up looking at a total of about 100, and, 100 or so patients. But these are guys just coming in his clinic, and he's saying, okay, look, you've got a partial thickness rotator cuff tear. I want to try this on it. Okay, you have tennis elbow. I want to try that. Let me try this on that. And then you've got a knee, you've got an Achilles. And so he had all these different co uh, comers, plantar fascia. And what you can see is that, at least in peripheral, peripheral areas, it seems to work pretty dang good. Or there's a, a nice response rate uh, in, in soft tissues. But Intra, in the joints, you know, and intra um, articular, it, it kind of dropped, dropped all the way down to 60%. So still, hey, 60% is better than nothing, right? It's better than steroids that last for, what, two to three weeks at best. So, <clears throat> you know, this is, again, it's a low powered study at, at a total of, of 90, but God, 90 is better than, than just a case series, right? I mean, I think that that shows that there's these people are really getting some relief. And uh, yes, it's not randomized and controlled and all that, but that can be done in the future right now. This is how we, this is the art. This is the art of medicine. This is what, what we should be sharing with each other all around the world to say, hey, look, Tommy, I, I've, I've used this uh, on elbows and man, it really seems to do well. well. Well, do you have any kind of data? Well, yeah, actually I did, I, I did. I, 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 can't, I did it for 100 patients and I sh it shows this. Well, that's fantastic, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff we should be sharing. There is such a thing as data that's not randomized and controlled trials, right? I mean, we, we have experience. We, we, and that's how we, we've all learned from each other over these years and throughout the history of physicians. It's you learn, you mentor, you, you share. And so... I just encourage all of you to, to, you know, just start making some notes maybe where you, let's say every time you treat a knee, you tell yourself, okay, I'm going to call this person back in three months and see how they're doing. And then, you know, you, even that is something that we can start to build things on. Okay. But this is a great slide to me. I mean, you know, it strongly supports that these injections are doing, doing something, um, at least in shoulder partial tears and then um and even even elbows and achilles tendons all right so let's go into a case so here's a person this is a woman that had a rotator cup tear partial tear with calcific tendon uh, calcific uh, tendinosis in the supraspinatus you see this big hyperechoic signal here now he i'm sorry this is a this is a t2 i was going to say that doesn't make sense that would be a tear but this is a t2 weighted mri which when you look at on ultrasound, it's gonna be hyperechoic with post-acoustic post shadowing. And look at the size of this thing, right? I mean, this is a heck of a, heck of a chunk. Um, and so, he hit it with, he did a little bit of arbitrage and then did, you know, he did calcific aspiration and they followed it and filled the defect with, with some H cam and here you go, right? I mean, at four weeks, at four weeks, you know, with this, if they had this woman had a rotator cuff repair, she would have been four months, right? Um, this is this is big. 
So now we're at eight weeks out. It looks even better. Look at that. I mean, you still have a little bit of scarring taking place and it's going to have to remodel, but I mean, that's fantastic. Now look at this, 11 months, seven months, 11 months, seven months, this thing's healed. Now look, he's reversed it. He's reversed the probe on you. So, you know, here is distal, but that's okay. I mean, we get the idea. That's, that's pretty dang nice. I mean, maybe a little bit left here. I wouldn't even call that unless there was sonopalpation uh, with it. And then 11 months, you, you know, this thing is, is relatively healed. There's probably some anisotropy, although this to me looks like an MR. Um, here's another case, 4.4 meter long defi deficit uh, length and width, you know, so it's four and a half by two, basically. Um, same situation, oh shucks. Oh no, where is the, uh, well, take my word for it, it healed. <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. I don't know where that other slide is. But in conclusion, you know, I hope, I hope this has helped you some in, in understanding that these, these products, for the most part, as long as you have a good company, they're safe. They're somewhat effective at this point. Um, we, we certainly need to do, have more studies and randomize studies. But in the meantime, we should be sharing our, our results with each other. Um, and I think it's promising. I think that, that these things are, are promising, not only, not only as surgical add-ons, it's what we've seen a lot. I didn't include all the studies. I just went, cause I figured most people on the call are not going to be surgeons who are wrapping, you know, wrapping skirt, uh, nerves and filling laminotomy or laminectomy defects. Um, so I'm mainly injection based stuff. That's what we do in IRON pretty much. So I didn't, but there are tons of studies as surgical add-ons, okay? Just like BMAC, you know, there's a lot of surgical add-on data with BMAC coming up. But my, my point is let's, let's, uh, let's see if we can have an intermediate step before we just jump to surgery. Because surgery is not easy and it's not, once someone is cut, as we know from biotensegrity, the fascia is never the same. You never have the right tension um, that, that person's forever changed. So again, um, hope this is helpful for you. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, if you guys want to collaborate in any way, please, this is my email. Please feel free to, to email me at any time and, and, um, happy to take some questions. I think I can do something. Let's see if I can do this. Dr. Uh, Tom Great lecture, very nice. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I think uh, we have some questions for you. Okay. Is there any possibility that a fresh uh, placenta or you would say an onion corian derived uh, would be used directly for the patient without uh, having to buy an allo allogenic product? or at this point it's just simply or allergenic well the 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 issue there is that you know you you have a, a a woman who's having a baby and now you you have if you're going to take fresh product and go straight into another human you, you know there's there's all types of infectious and sterility questions there. Now, again, this was done in the 30s. This was done in the 1930s for burn victims and people with, with bad traumas, you know, like legs getting ripped off and, and things. So with big debriding wounds, you know, open fractures, they'd wrap this thing and it would heal fantastic. But I think what happened was there was there must have been some infections or probably pharmaceutically driven or something that they shut that down. And, but I believe that's making a comeback. I believe that that's going to come back. The, the big question is going to be is how can you sterilize? And this is, this is the question. The, 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 the only question is how can you sterilize any product before you put it in another human being? 
right. without right. without killing all the stem cells? That's the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's really a, a very relevant question because I I can uh, I have seen something like this being done by uh, cosmetic surgeons where they actually harvest uh, uh, a layer of the placenta and then put it on birds, burn patients, or to some extent, non-healing wounds. Sure. And uh, they reported success in, in that procedure. But anyway, uh, going back to uh, the issue of the allograft uh, umbilical cord, uh, because I know there's a lot of, of, as you said, there's just a lot of, of uh, companies who are offering this. And it's very hard to tell which one are really the good ones. So from your perspective, uh, can you tell us which are the good ones? Not necessarily the bad ones, just the good ones. <laughs> well, you know, here, here's the problem with that. Every time I think someone is a good one and I say, oh, that, that, they look good. Well, then I, uh, I, I get these, I get always get notices from the FDA. I always want to know who's in trouble. You know, like there was a company called, not to pick on anybody, but there was a company called Precision. And Precision seemed to have, they were, seemed to be doing a pretty decent job. Um, but then we find out that they're doing a terrible job and the FDA shut them down. So, you know, it, it, it's like, <sighs> 